Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Unsolved Mysteries Iceberg, where I break down some of the most fascinating and dark unsolved mysteries from the most well-known to the most obscure. On this iceberg, we will explore a book written in an undecipherable language, a tale of green-skinned children, a mysterious hum that you may have heard, and much more. Also, this is an iceberg series that I intend to build upon. There are a near infinite amount of unsolved mysteries out there, so look out for my next videos in this series. If all goes well, this will be the basis for a series for years to come. But before we dive in, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more Lazy Chill Zone content. Also, join the Discord to connect with a community of like-minded people. And for people who want to take it to the next level, check out my Patreon or consider purchasing a YouTube membership. It all helps big time. All the links are in the description below. Bermuda Triangle. The Bermuda Triangle, a mysterious region in the North Atlantic Ocean, is infamous for the unexplained disappearances of ships and aircraft. It is loosely defined by its three vertices in Miami, Bermuda, and Puerto Rico. Historically, the Bermuda Triangle gained notoriety through a series of unexplained disappearances starting in the early 20th century. Notable incidents include the disappearance of the USS Cyclops in 1918 and Flight 19 in 1945, both vanishing without a trace. These events, along with others, have cemented the Triangle's reputation as a place of mystery and intrigue, sparking numerous theories and speculation about the causes of these disappearances. Geographically, the Bermuda Triangle covers about 500,000 square miles of ocean, a significant and heavily trafficked area. The region is subject to complex climatic conditions, including powerful Gulf Stream currents and sudden severe weather changes. Several scientific theories have been proposed to explain the phenomena associated with the Bermuda Triangle. These include the presence of methane hydrates on the ocean floor. Additionally, the area's unique weather patterns and magnetic anomalies are often cited as factors that can lead to navigational issues. However, no single theory universally accounts for all the disappearances, and many of the proposed explanations remain speculative. Supernatural theories surrounding the Bermuda Triangle often involve extraterrestrial activity, time warps, and other dimensional phenomena. Such theories are popular in fiction and folklore, appealing to the mystery and unknown aspects of the Triangle, despite being dismissed by the scientific community as speculative and unfounded. D.B. Cooper D.B. Cooper is an alias for an unidentified individual who hijacked Northwest Orient Airlines Flight 305 on November 24, 1971. This case remains one of the greatest unsolved mysteries in FBI history, involving a daring mid-flight ransom demand and escape. He conveyed his demand for $200,000 in four parachutes through a note to a flight attendant. After receiving the ransom and the parachutes at Seattle-Tacoma Airport, Cooper released the passengers. The plane took off again, heading towards Mexico City, as per his instructions, with the crew and Cooper on board. While flying over the dense forests of southwestern Washington, Cooper jumped out of the plane with a parachute and the ransom money. Despite extensive searches by the FBI, neither Cooper nor a significant part of the ransom was ever found. The rugged, wooded terrain and the uncertainties surrounding his jump's precise location have made this one of the most elusive manhunts in history. Speculations about his fate vary widely, with some believing he perished during the jump and others suggesting he successfully escaped. Despite extensive analysis of found evidence like a portion of the ransom money and a clip-on tie, the case remains the only unsolved skyjacking in history. Amelia Earhart's Disappearance Amelia Earhart, a pioneering aviator, embarked on a daring around-the-world flight in 1937. Her attempt to circumnavigate the globe tragically ended in one of history's most enduring mysteries, with Earhart and her navigator, Fred Noonan, vanishing without a trace. Earhart's final flight in her Lockheed Electra 
began on June 1, 1937, with the goal of flying around the world along the equator. Her journey was fraught with challenges, including mechanical issues and navigational difficulties. The last communication from Earhart was on July 2, 1937, near Howland Island in the Pacific Ocean. Despite being close to her destination, she reported difficulty in finding the island and poor weather conditions, complicating her navigation. Following her last transmission, an extensive search operation was launched, becoming one of the largest in history. The U.S. Navy and Coast Guard scoured the ocean, but no trace of Earhart, Noonan, or their aircraft was found. In 1939, Earhart was officially declared lost at sea. The disappearance sparked numerous theories and continued investigations, but the exact fate of Earhart and Noonan remains a mystery. Over the decades, theories about Earhart's disappearance have ranged from crashing at sea to being captured by Japanese forces. Some hypothesize that they landed on an uninhabited island and eventually perished. Despite various expeditions and analyses of potential artifacts, conclusive evidence of Earhart's final resting place continues to elude researchers and historians. The Zodiac Killer The Zodiac Killer is an unidentified serial killer who terrorized Northern California in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Known for his cryptic letters and ciphers sent to newspapers, his identity remains one of the most elusive in American criminal history, with a series of unsolved murders attributed to him. The Zodiac Killer is confirmed to have committed five murders between 1968 and 1969, though he claimed to have killed as many as 37. His victims were primarily young couples in secluded areas, along with a lone taxi driver. The Zodiac taunted police and the public with letters to newspapers, some containing ciphers, boasting of the killings and threatening more violence. These communications, often beginning with the phrase, this is the Zodiac speaking, became a chilling hallmark of his crimes, with only a few of the ciphers being definitively solved. The investigation into the Zodiac killer involved several law enforcement agencies, including the FBI. Despite extensive efforts, the case was hampered by the lack of advanced forensic technology at the time, inconsistencies in witness statements, and the geographical spread of the crimes. The Zodiac's letters and ciphers were intensely scrutinized for clues, and numerous suspects were investigated, but definitive evidence linking anyone to all the crimes was never found. Over the years, the case has been periodically reopened as new technologies, like DNA analysis, have developed, but it remains officially unsolved. Over the decades, various theories about the Zodiac's identity have been proposed, and several suspects have been named, but no charges have ever been laid. One theory suggests the Zodiac could have been a police officer or military member familiar with investigative techniques. The case has also spawned conspiracy theories and claims of false confessions. But despite an almost unprecedented output of man hours over half a century, the case is no closer to being resolved today than it was then. Mary Celeste. The Mary Celeste is an infamous maritime mystery involving a fully equipped ship found drifting and deserted in the Atlantic Ocean. Discovered on December 5, 1872, the ship's abandonment remains one of the most puzzling enigmas in nautical history, with its crew and passengers vanishing without a trace. The Mary Celeste was found by a British brig, adrift in the Atlantic near the Azores. The ship was largely intact and still under sail, but without a soul on board. Its cargo of denatured alcohol was untouched, personal belongings were undisturbed, and the crew's provisions remained plentiful. The only lifeboat was missing, and the ship's logbook had not been updated for 10 days. Despite these eerie findings, there were no signs of violence or struggle, fueling widespread speculation about the fate of the crew and passengers. 
An official investigation followed the ship's return to port. Theories about the crew's disappearance ranged from piracy and mutiny to natural disasters and supernatural phenomena. However, no evidence of foul play or violence was found. Speculation was rife, with stories of sea monsters, ghost ships, and Bermuda Triangle-like phenomena gaining popularity. The lack of concrete evidence led to wild conjecture and myth-making, overshadowing the more mundane possibilities. The crew's fate remained an enduring mystery, with the investigation ultimately failing to provide a satisfactory explanation for their disappearance. Over the years, more plausible theories have emerged. One suggests that the crew abandoned ship due to a fear of an explosion, as fumes from the alcohol cargo may have built up in the hold. Another theory posits a sudden water spout, which could have caused a rapid influx of water, leading the crew to believe the ship was sinking. The Lost Colony of Roanoke The Lost Colony of Roanoke is one of the oldest unsolved mysteries in American history. Established in 1587 on Roanoke Island, North Carolina, the entire colony vanished by 1590, leaving behind no clear indication of the settlers' fate and only cryptic clues to hint at what might have happened. Roanoke Colony was founded by a group of English settlers led by John White, who was later appointed as its governor. Initially, relations with the local Native American tribes were strained, adding to the colony's struggles. White returned to England for supplies, but his return was delayed due to England's war with Spain. When he finally came back to Roanoke in 1590, he found the settlement deserted. The houses had been dismantled, and there was no trace of the 115 colonists he had left behind, including his daughter and granddaughter, the first English child born in America. Upon his return, White found the word Croatoan carved into a post. He took these as signs that the colonists had moved to Croatoan Island, but worsening weather and other circumstances prevented him from conducting a search. No evidence of a struggle or battle was found at the site, and the colonists' belongings had largely disappeared. This lack of clear evidence left the fate of the Roanoke settlers a mystery, giving rise to numerous theories and speculations. Some suggest they were absorbed into friendly Native American tribes. Others hypothesized that they were either killed or taken captive by hostile tribes. Paranormal explanations, such as alien abduction, have also been suggested in modern times. The Voynich Manuscript The Voynich Manuscript is one of the most enigmatic books ever found. Discovered in 1912 by antique book dealer Wilfred Voynich, the manuscript is famous for its unknown writing system and mysterious illustrations. Its origins, authorship, and purpose remain one of the most intriguing puzzles in the history of cryptography. Physically, the Voynich manuscript consists of about 240 vellum pages, some of which fold out to reveal larger diagrams. It's divided into several sections based on its content, each featuring unique illustrations. The botanical section contains drawings of unidentifiable plants. The astronomical section includes diagrams of celestial bodies and zodiac signs. The biological section is filled with drawings of small human figures and what appears to be biological cells. The manuscript also includes a pharmacological section with drawings of medicinal herbs and an obscure section with dense text and unknown symbols adding to its mystique. The manuscript's history prior to the 20th century is shrouded in mystery. It is believed to have been created in the 15th century based on carbon dating of the vellum. Wilfred Voynich acquired the manuscript in 1912 from a Jesuit college in Italy, after which it gained public attention. It was likely initially owned by the Holy Roman Emperor Rudolf II, who reportedly believed it was the work of Roger Bacon, a 13th century English philosopher. Deciphering the Voynich manuscript has been a challenge due to its unknown alphabet and language. 
Numerous cryptographers, linguists, and historians have attempted to decode it, including figures during both world wars. The text does not match any known language, and statistical analysis shows patterns distinct from other languages. While some words have been identified in repeated sequences, their meanings remain elusive. Techniques ranging from computer algorithms to historical linguistic analysis have been applied, but no definitive interpretation has been accepted by the scholarly community. Some even propose that the manuscript is an elaborate hoax, although the complexity and detail of the work make this theory less likely in my view. Theories about the Voynich manuscript range from the plausible to the fantastical. Some scholars suggest it may be a treatise on nature, written in a deliberately obscure language to protect its secrets. Others speculate it could be a lost alchemical compendium. More esoteric theories propose extraterrestrial origins or a connection to a secret society. My personal theory is that the manuscript is some sort of creation of an alchemical secret society. The cryptic illustrations and text could be symbolic representations of the society's beliefs, rituals, and understanding of the world. The manuscript might have functioned both as a sacred text for the society and as a tool to obscure their practices from outsiders, or perhaps the ability to interpret it was one of the mysteries an inductee into the society received. What evidence do I have for this theory? About as much evidence as all the other theories have. None. But that's what makes the Voynich manuscript so fascinating, isn't it? The Dyatlov Pass Incident The Dyatlov Pass Incident refers to the mysterious deaths of nine hikers in the Ural Mountains of Russia in February 1959. This perplexing event, occurring on the eastern side of Kolat Cycle, has puzzled experts for decades, with its strange circumstances and unexplained aspects continuing to provoke debate and speculation. The group, led by Igor Dyatlov, consisted of experienced hikers from the Ural Polytechnical Institute. The team embarked on their journey in late January 1959, facing harsh winter conditions. They maintained a diary and took photographs, documenting their progress. On January 31st, they arrived at the edge of a highland area and prepared to climb. In a move that would later seem ominous, Dyatlov agreed to send a telegram to their sports club once the group returned to Vijay, but they never made it. After the hikers failed to return, a search operation was launched. Rescuers discovered the group's tent on Kolat Cycle, badly damaged and abandoned. The tent was cut open from the inside, and belongings, including shoes, were left behind, indicating a hasty departure. The bodies of the hikers were found at varying distances from the tent, in different states of undress, which was puzzling given the freezing temperatures. The initial discovery of the bodies only deepened the mystery with no immediate explanation for their bizarre and tragic end. The official investigation found that the hikers died of hypothermia, but this explanation did not account for the perplexing details of the scene. Some bodies showed signs of severe trauma, such as a fractured skull and chest injuries, comparable to a car crash. One of the hikers had her tongue and eyes missing. Theories ranged from an attack by indigenous Mansi people to secret military involvement. The investigation noted high levels of radiation on some clothing and strange orange skin and gray hair on the bodies. These findings fueled various theories, but the investigation concluded inconclusively, citing an unknown compelling force as the cause of death. Over the years, Numerous theories have been proposed to explain the Dyatlov Pass incident, including avalanche, military experiments, and even extraterrestrial encounters. Recent investigations suggest a small avalanche could have forced the group out of their tent, with subsequent hypothermia and panic leading to their demise. However, this theory does not fully explain all the bizarre aspects of the incident. 
the Oak Island Money Pit. The Oak Island Money Pit, located on Oak Island in Nova Scotia, Canada, has been shrouded in mystery for centuries. Famous for its supposed buried treasure, the Money Pit has captivated treasure hunters and enthusiasts for over two centuries, with numerous theories about what lies deep beneath its surface. Discovered in 1795 by a teenager named Daniel McGuinness, the Oak Island Money Pit initially appeared as a circular depression in the ground. Early excavations uncovered a layer of flagstones and several platforms of logs at regular intervals down the pit along with marks on the walls of the shaft suggesting the use of picks. As excavations continued, the pit revealed more complex features, including a series of booby traps. At 90 feet, a stone inscribed with mysterious symbols was found, leading to heightened speculation. However, when diggers reached a depth of about 100 feet, the pit flooded with seawater, thwarting further exploration and hinting at an ingeniously engineered trap system. Over the 19th and 20th centuries, the Money Pit attracted numerous expeditions. Treasure hunters attempted to overcome the water traps and dig deeper, but with limited success. Various methods were employed, from drilling to dynamiting, each leading to more intriguing finds, but no treasure. Notable discoveries included pieces of chain, wood slivers, and other materials at various depths, along with more flood tunnels. These efforts, however, often resulted in collapsed excavations and further flooding, with the mystery of the pit deepening with each attempt. In recent years, the Oak Island mystery has been the focus of several television series, bringing modern technology and new theories to the fore. Teams equipped with advanced machinery and expertise continue to explore the island, uncovering artifacts like coins, old tools, and fragments of parchment, which fuel further speculation. Theories about the Money Pit's contents range from pirate treasure, such as that of Captain Kidd, to historical artifacts like the Ark of the Covenant, or, and I'm not joking here, Shakespearean manuscripts. However, in my view, the pit was used to hide booty seized by British privateers during the American Revolution and was likely retrieved upon completion of the war. The Black Dahlia The Black Dahlia case is one of the most infamous unsolved crimes in American history. The ending of Elizabeth Short, whose body was found in Los Angeles in 1947, has been shrouded in mystery and intrigue for decades. Elizabeth Short, a young woman from Massachusetts, moved to Los Angeles with dreams of becoming an actress. In LA, she struggled to find work in the film industry, but was often seen socializing in the Hollywood area with influential people connected with the film industry. On January 15, 1947, Elizabeth Short's body was discovered in a vacant lot in the Limert Park neighborhood of Los Angeles. Unfortunately, the details of this crime are too graphic for YouTube. The case quickly attracted a media frenzy, and Short was posthumously nicknamed the Black Dahlia in the press, a name that has since become synonymous with the case. The investigation into Short's murder was extensive, involving numerous law enforcement officers and leading to the interrogation of several suspects. Despite the high-profile nature of the case and the public's fascination with it, the authorities faced dead ends. Over the years, dozens of people have been suspected, ranging from known criminals to Short's acquaintances, but no one has ever been definitively linked to the murder, leaving it a cold case. The Tamam Shud Case. The Tamam Shud Case, also known as the Mystery of the Somerton Man, is one of Australia's most enduring unsolved cases. It began with the discovery of an unidentified man's body on Somerton Beach in 1948. Dressed in a suit and without identification, his possessions included an unused train ticket, a comb, gum, and cigarettes. An autopsy revealed no obvious cause of death 
and his dental records match no known person. The lack of clues and the man's unknown identity set the stage for one of Australia's most baffling mysteries. The mystery deepened when a small piece of paper with the words Tamam Shud, meaning ended or finished in Persian, was found in a hidden pocket of the man's trousers. This led to the discovery of a book, The Rubiat of Omar Khayyam, with a phone number and an indecipherable code scribbled inside. Despite extensive efforts, the code has never been cracked, and the book's connection to the man remains a mystery. The investigation into the Somerton man's identity and cause of death encountered numerous dead ends. Theories ranged from him being a spy, given the Cold War context, to a jilted lover. The phone number in the book led to a woman who denied knowing the man, but seemed visibly shaken when shown a plaster cast of his face. Despite numerous leads and theories, the case remained unsolved, with no conclusive evidence to explain the man's identity or the circumstances of his death. The Hinterkaifeck Slayings The Hinterkaifeck Slayings, a chilling unsolved case from 1922, involved the gruesome slaying of six people at the Hinterkaifeck farm in Germany. The case's mysterious circumstances and the identity of the criminal have perplexed experts for nearly a century. Hinterkaifeck was a remote farmstead located north of Munich. Its residents included farmer Andreas Gruber, his wife Kazilia, their daughter Victoria, her children Kazilia and Joseph, and the maid, Maria Baumgartner. On April 4, 1922, neighbors discovered their bodies with unspeakable acts having been committed. The investigation revealed the maid and the entire family had been ended with a pickaxe-like tool. Strangely, the farm animals were found well-fed and neighbors reported seeing smoke from the chimney days after the slayings, suggesting the responsible party remained at the farm. The investigation was hampered by the lack of advanced forensic techniques and the isolated location of the farm. Initial police work focused on interviewing locals and examining the crime scene, but no definitive evidence was found. Some evidence was mysterious, such as footprints discovered in the snow leading to the farm, but not away from it. Further, reports were noted of strange sounds heard in the attic prior to the crime, and reports of missing keys suggested the individual might have hidden on the farm before committing the crimes. Despite these clues, the authorities struggled to piece together a clear picture of the events. Over the years, several theories and suspects have been proposed. One theory suggested that Victoria's husband, who had reportedly died in World War I, had returned to commit the acts. Others believed it could have been a robbery gone wrong or a crime of passion. Perhaps the most sinister theory is that a vagrant had lived in their attic unbeknownst to the family, and perhaps fearing discovery, slew the family and their maid. Various local residents and transient laborers were suspected, but no conclusive evidence was ever found to link anyone to the crimes. Given that this one is now over 100 years old, it seems unlikely that the case will ever be solved. The Phoenix Lights. The Phoenix Lights phenomenon, witnessed on March 13, 1997, stands as one of the most famous and widely observed UFO sightings in history. Spanning across Arizona, Nevada, and parts of Mexico, the event involved sightings of mysterious lights and craft by thousands of people. The Phoenix Lights were first reported around 7.30 p.m with sightings continuing well into the night. The event unfolded in two distinct phases. The first involved a series of stationary lights seen in a triangular formation, while the second featured a series of stationary lights that lingered in the sky. Witnesses described seeing a massive V-shaped craft spanning several football fields in length, silently gliding over their heads. The lights were described as bright and orb-like, maintaining a steady formation. 
Reports came from a wide range of observers, including experienced pilots and police officers. The phenomenon covered a swath of about 300 miles, from the Nevada line through Phoenix to the northern edge of Tucson. Public reaction to the Phoenix Lights ranged from awe and curiosity to fear and skepticism. The media quickly picked up the story, with local news channels and national programs covering the sightings. Initial explanations from authorities suggested that the lights were flares dropped by military aircraft during training exercises. However, this explanation was met with skepticism by many witnesses who noted the silent, steady movement of the lights, inconsistent with the behavior of flares. The lack of an immediate and clear explanation from military or governmental organizations fueled further speculation and debate about the nature of the lights. In response to public demand, several investigations were launched into the Phoenix Lights. These included efforts by UFO research organizations, independent researchers, and eventually, some governmental inquiries. The Air Force initially denied any involvement, but later claimed that the lights were indeed flares dropped by A-10 Warthog aircraft during training exercises. However, many researchers and eyewitnesses disputed this account, pointing out discrepancies in the timing and characteristics of the lights compared to typical flare behavior. Eyewitness accounts of the Phoenix lights were diverse and numerous. Many witnesses reported feeling a sense of awe and wonder at the site, with some describing a feeling of peacefulness. Pilots and aviation experts who saw the lights noted their precise formation and the lack of sound, unlike any aircraft known at the time. Interestingly, former Arizona Governor Fife Symington, who initially mocked the incident by dressing up an aide in an alien outfit, later admitted to having witnessed the phenomenon himself describing it as otherworldly and unlike any man-made object. The Sodder Children Disappearance The Sodder Children Disappearance refers to the mysterious vanishing of five siblings following a devastating house fire on Christmas Eve, 1945, in Fayetteville, West Virginia. The Sodder family's home was engulfed in flames during the early hours of Christmas Day. George and Jenny Sodder, along with four of their nine children, escaped, but five of the Sodder children were thought to be trapped inside. However, a subsequent search of the ruins yielded no remains, leading to speculation that the children had not perished in the fire. Questions arose about the fire's cause, with some evidence suggesting possible foul play, further deepening the mystery. The absence of remains led to extensive searches and investigations, both by authorities and the Sodder family. The initial investigation was hampered by professional mistakes, and the fire's cause was controversially attributed to faulty wiring. The Sodder family contested this conclusion, noting several unusual circumstances, such as a ladder being moved, strange phone calls before the fire, and reports of the children being seen after the fire. The FBI became involved, but no conclusive evidence was found. The lack of physical remains in the fire's debris particularly fueled speculation that the children might have been kidnapped or had escaped. Various theories have been proposed regarding the children's fate. However, the most popular theory suggests they were kidnapped by someone with a grudge against George Sodder for his outspoken criticism of Mussolini and the fascist regime in Italy. Another theory suggests that the attack and kidnappings were done by the Mafia. Over the years, numerous leads and sightings were reported. However, the most chilling piece of evidence to emerge was a letter including a photograph sent to the family in the 1960s, purportedly showing one of the missing children as an adult. For what it's worth, the family believes the missing children may have been taken to Italy, where they lived out their lives. The lack of any further contact past 1967 was understood by the remaining family members to potentially be out of concern for the safety of all parties involved. My view, or perhaps hope, is that these kids did survive. There's just too many weird factors here. 
and it stretches credulity to believe that five bodies could vanish to nothing from a standard house fire. I note that the missing children may still be alive today, so there's hope of a real resolution here. The most plausible way I see this happening is if relatives connect through a popular DNA testing service. The Rendlesham Forest Incident The Rendlesham Forest Incident, often dubbed Britain's Roswell, is a series of reported sightings of unexplained lights and alleged UFO encounters near RAF Woodbridge in Suffolk, England in December 1980. The incident began on the night of December 26, 1980, when military personnel from RAF Woodbridge observed strange lights descending into Rendlesham Forest. Thinking it was a downed aircraft, they ventured into the forest to investigate. There, they encountered a metallic glowing object with colored lights. As they approached, it reportedly moved through the trees, avoiding their approach. The servicemen described it as a craft of unknown origin, sparking immediate interest and concern within the military community. Over the following nights, additional personnel, including the deputy base commander, reported further strange lights, not only in the forest, but also in the sky above. The base commander led a team into the forest and recorded their observations on a tape recorder. His team observed unexplained lights moving through the trees and a pulsating glow from an unidentified object. They also found impressions and scorings on the ground where the initial sighting occurred. Geiger counter readings taken at the site showed higher than normal radiation levels, adding to the mystery. Several military witnesses provided detailed accounts. The base commander's recorded audio from that night conveyed real-time reactions to the unfolding events, describing beams of light streaming down from the sky and the erratic movements of the lights. Other servicemen corroborated these observations, with some reporting that the animals on a nearby farm went into a frenzy during the incident. The consistency of these accounts, coupled with the military standing of the witnesses, lent a significant degree of credibility to the events. The Max Headroom Broadcast Signal Intrusion The Max Headroom Broadcast Signal Intrusion is a notorious television event that occurred on November 22, 1987, in Chicago. Unknown individuals hijacked the broadcast signals of two local TV stations, WGN-TV and WTTW, temporarily interrupting scheduled programming. This act, carried out by individuals who have never been identified, has entered the pop culture pantheon. The first intrusion happened during WGN-TV's 9 p.m. news broadcast. At approximately 9.14 p.m., the screen abruptly went black before being replaced by a person wearing a Max Headroom mask and sunglasses, set against a corrugated metal background that mimicked the character's dynamic, computer-generated background. The intrusion lasted only about 25 seconds, with no audio aside from a buzzing noise, before engineers at WGN switched the broadcast frequency and regained control. Later that night, at approximately 11.15 p.m., during a broadcast of a Doctor Who episode, the signal was again hijacked. This time, the intrusion lasted about 90 seconds. The figure, again wearing a Max Headroom mask, was this time accompanied by distorted and garbled audio. The person made various nonsensical statements, references to WGN commentators, and exhibited bizarre behaviors. At one point, the mask was removed, revealing a partly obscured face. The broadcast ended with a shot of a rump being roasted with a fly swatter. The intrusions caused immediate confusion and concern among viewers and broadcasters. WGN's news anchor, Dan Roan, was visibly bemused when the signal returned to the newsroom, joking, Well, if you're wondering what's happened, so am I. The incident became headline news, with widespread media coverage across North America. Broadcasters were alarmed by the security breach, 
prompting reviews of transmission security. The Federal Communications Commission, better known as the FCC, and the FBI launched investigations immediately after the incident. However, the search for the culprits was complex and challenging. Investigators interviewed engineers and technicians and examined broadcasting equipment, trying to trace the signal's origin. One of the main difficulties was the sophisticated nature of the signal override, which indicated a deep understanding of broadcasting technology. The hijackers had successfully manipulated the broadcast frequencies, a feat that would have required specialized equipment and expertise. Numerous theories have been proposed about the identity and motives of the hijackers. Some speculated that it was the work of a disgruntled employee or an insider with detailed knowledge of the broadcasting systems. Others believed it was the act of amateur hackers, demonstrating their technical skills and mocking mainstream media. The technical execution of the Max Headroom incident was sophisticated, requiring knowledge not only of broadcasting technology, but also of the specific practices of the targeted stations. This is a strong mark against the amateur hacker's theory. The hijackers would have needed a powerful transmitter and an intricate understanding of broadcast signal pathways, and as such, I suspect the idea that this was amateurs is unlikely. Experts deduce that the hijackers likely set up a transmission powerful enough to override the station's signals. This would have required them to be in close physical proximity to the broadcast towers. Additionally, the timing of the intrusion indicated careful planning, suggesting the hijackers had inside knowledge of the station's operations or conducted detailed reconnaissance. Again, nothing suggests the work of amateurs. Anyway, feel free to confess to your involvement in the comments below. Okay, so you've made it this far. Allow me to promote myself for one quick moment. Your support of this channel makes it possible for me to devote so much time to creating content, and the more the channel grows, the more time I can spend on it. With that said, if you enjoy my content, remember to like, subscribe, and share it with people who you know would enjoy it. And, if you really want to take it to the next level, consider signing up for the Lazy Chill Zone membership on YouTube or the Patreon. For Patreon, the lowest tier is just a buck. And if you don't want to do any of the above, that's cool too. Just knowing I've created something that you've enjoyed for this long is my dream come true. The Isdal Woman One of Norway's most profound mysteries, the case of the Isdal Woman, revolves around an unidentified woman found dead in Isdalen Valley near Bergen in 1970. Despite extensive investigations, her identity and the circumstances of her death have remained unsolved, spawning numerous theories over the decades. On November 29, 1970, a woman's body was discovered in a remote area of Isdalen. Notably, she was found in a peculiar position with burned passports and sleeping pills nearby, suggesting a possible ending by her own hand. However, the extensive injuries on her body, including smoke inhalation and carbon monoxide poisoning, hinted at a more sinister cause. Investigation into her background revealed a trail of multiple aliases and identities. The woman had traveled across Europe with a number of different passports. She frequently changed hotels and seemed to prefer staying unnoticed, adding an aura of mystery to her character. This pattern of behavior fueled speculation that she was involved in espionage, especially given the context of the Cold War. The most popular theory is that the Isdal woman was a spy. Her movements across Europe, use of multiple identities, and the fact that her labels were removed from her clothes and belongings suggest she was trying to conceal her identity. The Cold War era was rife with espionage activity in Europe, and Norway was of strategic importance. This theory is supported by reports of her fluent use of several languages and her sophisticated demeanor. 
Witnesses who encountered the Isdal woman described her as guarded. Some reports suggest she seemed anxious or on the lookout, as if she was expecting someone. This behavior further supports the espionage theory, suggesting she might have been involved in secretive activities or was on the run. Other theories propose she was a criminal on the run, a victim of a tragic accident, or involved in illicit activities. Some speculate that she may have been fleeing an abusive relationship or was involved in drug smuggling. However, these theories lack substantial evidence, and the meticulous way she covered her tracks suggests that she had intelligence operations training. The hum. The hum is a low-frequency noise reported globally. First noted in the UK during the 1970s, it's heard by a minority termed hearers. Persistent and invasive, its source remains unidentified, leading to various theories. Hearers describe the hum as a distant rumbling or droning. More noticeable indoors and at night, it causes annoyance and distress. Not everyone can hear it. Reports are geographically diverse, from urban to remote areas. Its persistent nature differentiates it from ordinary noises, making it a subject of intrigue and discomfort for those who perceive it. Industrial machinery and equipment are potential sources. They emit low-frequency sounds that could manifest as the hum. But this theory falls short in explaining reports from areas distant from industrial activities, suggesting multiple causes. Environmental elements, like seismic activity, are proposed as causes. Seismic movements can generate low-frequency sounds. Infrasound, another environmental factor, falls below human hearing thresholds, but can still cause unease. Wind turbines and ocean waves are natural infrasound sources. These theories suggest an environmental origin for some cases, but lack comprehensive evidence linking them directly to the hum. The growth of wireless technology has led to theories about electromagnetic fields contributing to the hum. Some hearers report correlations between their perception and proximity to technological devices. However, scientific backing for this connection isn't there at this point. Psychological aspects such as communal reinforcement or mass suggestion, are also considered. Awareness of the hum could induce a belief in hearing it, at least in some cases. Some of the most famous hums are in Taos, New Mexico, and Windsor in Canada. Interestingly, in the case of the Windsor hum, when blast furnaces used for steel processing were decommissioned, the hum stopped. So I've actually heard this hum in an area known for significant industrial activity, and I'm a strong believer in the correlation between heavy industrial activity and the hum. That said, I've only heard it on a few occasions, for a limited period of time, and I can't imagine how disruptive hearing it constantly would be. Question for viewers. Have you ever heard the hum? If so, where have you heard it? I'm truly fascinated by this mystery given my personal experience with it. The Lead Masks Case The Lead Masks Case is an unsolved mystery from Brazil involving the unexplained deaths of two men found wearing lead eye masks. On August 20th, 1966, the bodies of two men were found on a hill near Rio de Janeiro. Both men were dressed in suits and waterproof coats and peculiarly, they wore lead masks, typically used for protection against radiation. No signs of violence or external injuries were evident. The scene contained odd elements, an empty water bottle, two wet towels, and a notebook with cryptic instructions about taking capsules at a specified time, awaiting a signal, and wearing the masks. The absence of any toxic substances in their system deepened the mystery. The most common explanation floated is that this was a case of espionage going awry. Danny Casolaro 
Danny Casolaro, an investigative journalist, was found dead in a hotel bathtub in 1991 under circumstances that sparked widespread suspicion and controversy. His death occurred amidst his investigation into a powerful and well-connected network he called the Octopus, deepening the mystery. Casolaro was investigating a complex web of alleged criminal activities involving high-level government officials, intelligence agencies, and private corporations. His focus was on the Inslaw affair, involving the potentially illegal redistribution of software called Promise. Casolaro believed that the Inslaw case was a part of a larger conspiracy, which he termed the Octopus. This investigation led him across various facets of corruption, including arms dealing and espionage. In early August 1991, Casolaro told his family he was close to concluding his investigation and would be traveling to Martinsburg, West Virginia, to meet a key source. His optimism and determination seemed undiminished. According to reports, he met several individuals in Martinsburg, though their identities and the content of their discussions remain unknown. Casolaro's family and friends reported he had received threatening messages and warned them that if something happened to him, it would not be an accident. On August 10, 1991, Casolaro was found dead in his hotel room's bathtub with his wrists slashed multiple times. The scene was quickly ruled a self-ending by local authorities, but several unusual factors cast doubt on this conclusion. His research papers and notes were missing from the hotel room, the room's carpet was wet, and there were no fingerprints, not even his own, on the razor blade or hotel room glasses. Yeah, I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say that's a bit sus and doesn't seem all that congruent with the self-ending hypothesis. The missing documents, which Casolaro claimed would expose the alleged conspiracy, were recovered in the course of the police investigation and investigated thoroughly by the authorities. Oh wait, sorry. I must have slipped into the universe where high-level corruption is taken seriously for a moment there. Despite Casolaro being a journalist working on a big story, none of his papers whatsoever were located. The investigation into Casolaro's death faced several challenges, including alleged mishandling by local police and the FBI's initial reluctance to get involved. The most prevalent theory is that he was silenced to prevent exposure of the octopus. Some speculate that he may have been misled or manipulated by sources with their own agendas. And if all that wasn't enough to convince you that he may have been onto something, at his funeral a limo pulled up and a military officer exited, approached Casolaro's coffin, put a medal on the coffin, saluted, and left the scene. Jeffrey Epstein. Wait, Jeffrey Epstein? This shouldn't be on an unsolved mysteries iceberg. All the mainstream news sources told me he ended himself on a consensual basis. Given that this one is entirely resolved, I do not recommend doing any further research or going down any rabbit holes. The above two paragraphs in this section were written and recorded of my own free will, without any interference, intervention, or coercion by any third party. The Green Children of Woolpit the Green Children of Woolpit is a medieval legend about two children with green skin who appeared in the village of Woolpit in Suffolk, England. In the 12th century, villagers discovered two children, a brother and sister, with green tinted skin near a wolf pit. Speaking an unknown language and refusing all food except beans, their mysterious appearance and behavior intrigued the locals. Eventually, they adapted to local food, and their skin lost its green color. The children gradually learned English and explained that they came from a place with no sunlight called St. Martin's Land. As they assimilated, the boy became sickly and died, 
But the girl thrived, eventually marrying a local man. And assuming the legend at least has some basis in reality, there's the potential that some of you viewing this right now are the descendants of Green Girl. Several theories have been proposed to explain this legend. One suggests they were Flemish children who got lost and surfaced in Woolpit, their green skin a result of malnourishment. Another theory posits a folktale allegory, symbolizing nature, humanity, and our alienation from nature. A more modern speculation is that they were extraterrestrial or from another dimension due to their unfamiliar language and green skin. Anyway, this one seems like a game of historical telephone to me, so I don't imagine we will ever have a clear answer as to what was up with these green kids. I like to imagine villagers embellishing the story of some unusual, abandoned, non-English speaking children over the decades. After all, what else was there to do in medieval wool pit in your downtime besides adding a few juicy details to the local legend? There's probably an alternative universe where the story that got passed down is that they were pig children, whose snouts and tails fell off as they adopted English culture. Also, perhaps this is a new Mandela oink effect. If you're from the Piglets of Wool Pit universe, please go ham in the comments below and make the tail a swine one. Yeah, yeah, Bebus one. And here's our first foray into the world of lost media, or, well, potential lost media. This is a rumored game for the Nintendo Entertainment System, first mentioned in a mail-order video game service called Play It Again. It was first seen in a June 1989 issue of Video Games and Computer Entertainment magazine. Subsequent appearances of the game were noted in the Play It Again listings for July, August, and September, with no further mentions of the game at any point. Despite extensive efforts, no physical copy, gameplay footage, or credible mention in any official gaming publication was found. The lack of evidence led many to believe it was a hoax, a typo, or a copyright trap. In 2021, a user from the Lost Media Wiki forums, known as Stinter Galactic, had a discussion with Neil Levin, a co-founder of Play It Again. During this conversation, Levin confirmed that they intentionally added false listings to identify imitators, suggesting that the copyright trap hypothesis was correct. Alternatively, it's a simple mistranslation of the Japan exclusive game Rai Rai Kianchi Baby Kianchi no Amida Daibuken. Also, just a quick aside, that name looked way more intimidating to pronounce. I mean, I'm sure I didn't entirely nail it, but I feel that could have gone much worse. Ro R. Adams III. Ro Adams, known for his pivotal role in the development of Wizardry 4 The Return of Werdna, considered one of the most difficult games of all time, has completely dropped off the planet. As a lead designer, he infused the game with complex puzzles and a notoriously high difficulty level. Also, his approach to game design in Wizardry 4 was groundbreaking. He reversed the traditional role-playing game narrative, placing players in the role of the main villain of the series. But back to the difficulty. The game was so difficult and unintuitive that the vast majority of players were unable to successfully exit the first room. No two-hour refund windows back then. If you're curious, the way you exited the first room was to capture or summon priests, then go to a specific tile in the first room and cast a light spell. Casting this spell would illuminate a door. The only problem is there were no hints to indicate that this was the solution to the first room, and the game only got more grueling from there. After his significant contributions to the gaming industry, Adam seemingly vanished from the public eye. In 2020, I had an email exchange with Robert Woodhead, one of the creators and lead designers of Wizardry. He forwarded some questions I had for Roe Adams 
onto his last known contact address. As of recording in January 2024, I have yet to hear back from Adams. Anyway, Ro, if you're out there, I would love to interview you for this channel. Or just talk about your design philosophy on Wizardry 4 from the perspective of someone who has not played it, wasn't there, and is looking back through a historical lens. That's part one of this iceberg series in the bag. I've already started working on the next one, so subscribe to get notified when it drops. Also, for anyone who wants to take that extra step, consider joining the Patreon or joining the Discord community. And speaking of the Patreon, shout out to my shout out tier subscribers, Noah Schubert and Kazak Cutie. I'm so thankful for your ongoing support. As always, until next time, peace out everyone.